The ideas expressed in the following presentations are those of the speakers and do not necessarily reflect the views of ACI or its committees. ACI web sessions are recorded at ACI conventions or other concrete industry events and will be made available for viewing free of charge for one week. Thereafter, they will be archived on the ACI website or added to ACI's online CEU program depending on their content. I'd like to bring up uh, Devin Daniel, Magnuson Clemensic Associates in Seattle. He's a design engineer and he's going to talk about the first performance based seismic design tower in Oakland, California. Thanks, Jeff. Yeah, as he mentioned, um, I'm Devin Daniel. I'm from Magnuson Clemensic Associates, and today we're just going to be quickly discussing the current state of practice for performance based design uh, under the city of Oakland, specifically as it relates to the tower at 1640 Broadway. So, as I'm sure you're aware, or at least some of you are aware, the use of performance-based design approach, as I'll also use PBSD just from now on, uh, to design buildings that exceed the code prescriptive building height, has grown rapidly among many West Coast cities within the last decade. In particular, Oakland has been an epicenter of development, creating a demand for high-rise towers. Traditional code-compliant design approaches impose significant impediments to the fiscal sense of a real estate development project. For high-rise towers exceeding 240 feet, a code-compliant design would prescriptively require a backup moment frame system or a dual system. This classical approach to building design imposes restrictions on unit layout, flexibility of utility routing, perimeter windows and balconies that would otherwise contribute to the overall value of a given project. At 330 feet tall, the 34-story high-rise tower at 1640 Broadway is the first PBSD tower to be exceed 240 feet in Oakland, California. The primary use of this building is residential, and at 416,000 square feet, the tower will offer approximately 254 rentable units, above-grade parking, retail at the ground level, and an amenity spaces at the top of the podium and at the top of the tower. Uh, SCB was our client in architectural design, and then Lennar is the owner. The lateral force resisting system for the tower consists of special reinforced concrete shear walls surrounding a central circulation core. An additional blade wall was provided at the easternmost face. Uh, both of these core elements are shown in blue on the image to the right. An eastern blade wall was shown to provide torsional stability. Uh, concrete coupling means are either embedded steel reinforced diagonally or conventionally, all depending on the length depth ratio and the shear stress ratio. While the PBSD approach has been used for some time, the actual implementation varies from jurisdiction to jurisdiction. The tower at 1640 Broadway is significant in terms of establishing the framework for a PBSD practices in a new jurisdiction. The PS PBSD approach focuses on the behavior and performance under design objectives rather than the prescriptive demands underneath the design requirements. So it is the intent of the building design underneath the PBSD approach to meet or exceed the requirements presented within the code for promoting health, safety, and welfare of its occupants. Because of its complexity, the analysis used to demonstrate the building behavior and performance, most building departments have implemented a requirement for an independent peer review panel, or a seismic design review team, SDRT, when designs are submitted for permit underneath the alternative means and methods clause of the IBC. Prior to initiating the design, Magnuson Clemensic Associates briefed the City of Oakland on the current state of practice implementing the PBSD approach among major West Coast cities and jurisdictions. This brief included uh, the minimum scope of the SDRT, composition of the SDRT, and interaction between the City's building department and the SDRT. Based on the discussion, the City of Oakland agreed upon a standard for handling future pro PBSD projects, and within a few months, MKA approached the City of Oakland with a detailed proposal to design the tower for 1640 Broadway. And then with this, the composition of the SDRT uh, is made up of a licensed professional structural engineer focusing on the superstructure, and then a licensed professional geotechnical engineer whose focus is on the foundation-related issues and the seismic hazard. And it should be noted that MKA did not have any part in selecting the SDRT, but rather the city selects those individuals. For performance objectives, basically what we're trying to hit is serviceability for the structure to remain essentially elastic during frequent earthquakes, and then a design basis earthquake for which that we design this uh, basically to code, and then uh, we verified that design using a risk-targeted maximum considered earthquake in the nonlinear time history analysis. So 
It's the intent of a performance-based approach to provide a building that meets code equivalency. However, it's the detailed nature of the performance-based approach that often leads to informing upon the code-based design process and the standards that comprise it. In context of the site, the seismic hazard for the design earthquake determined from a code-based approach, shown in the dash line up here, was determined to be approximately two-thirds the seismic hazard under a site-specific performance-based approach, shown in the solid line. And these uh, ratios were determined at the period range of interest for the tower, where the primary mode of translation in the east-west direction was 3.7 seconds and 3.1 seconds in the north-south direction. The code-based design under ASE 710 uh, utilizes NGA West 1 hazard analysis data, whereas the site-specific information is based on the more current data set, NGA West 2, which is also what's comprised in the ASE 716. We decided to go with the ASE 716 because it represented the most modern uh, seismic hazard data. In comparison between a possible solution for the code-based design, a dual system is, is required uh, for any structure exceeding 240 feet. The lateral system consists of a special reinforced concrete core slash blade wall with an additional backup moment frame system capable of handling at least 25% of the overall base shear. In order to do, accommodate this design requirement, backup moment frame systems can quickly become an extensive portion of the primary structure. The core wall stance for the code base design uh, is approximately 30 feet by 30 feet and the blade wall stance is also about 30 feet. As noted in the preamble of the presentation, the incorporation of uh, this backup moment frame system can restrict unit layouts, mechanical electrical routing, internal circulation, and increase the overall amount of formwork required for all four levels, all with the added cost of the project. In context with the tower at 1640 Broadway, this consisted of six two, two foot six by two foot six deep moment frames located near and around the perimeter, this was primarily to re reduce the amount of moment frame beams that, all, that would exist all the way around the perimeter. The PBSD approach requires a slightly larger core stance in the east-west direction, maintaining the same initial core stance in the north-south direction, being about 30 by 40 feet. Additionally, this required the addition of a wing wall in the north-south direction matched with an increased length to added uh, easternmost face blade wall to maintain storational stability. It's worth noting that the overall stance on the westernmost wall is about 50 foot 6. So a quick recap on the two designs is the performance based approach. Yes, it reduces the overall footprint in comparison to the code based design by limiting the amount of perimeter beams. It does induce a larger core stance but its impact on programming is substantially smaller than the code based design. Also, there is a higher concentration of core wall longitudinal horizontal reinforcement. This is all based off of a deformation analysis underneath the nonlinear time history. We target areas with high strain in order to reduce the overall building drift. We also use steel coupling beams versus concrete coupling beams in a lot of locations because the post yield stiffness of those elements has significantly higher rotational values. This allows us to maintain a torsional balance in the seeking stiffness. ASC 716, uh, this is what we use for determining all of our uh, ground motion suites. Uh, they represent conditional mean spectra, or method two of ASC 716. Uh, they're targeted MCE spectrums with conditioning periods representing the primary translational periods for the long period suite, and then secondary translational periods for the short period suite. We target the response to be at least 75% of the spectral ordinance determined from the uniform hazard spectra, or method one. And then ground motions are scaled such that the maximum direction spectra from the suite meets or exceeds the target response. And some notes on this, ground motion time history records at small site to source distances can provide intense shaking compared to those recorded at larger distance. Near source records often contain a large double-sided velocity pulse that ruptured towards the site or a forward directivity rupture. Uh, the period of these pulses is a function of the mean distance from the site to source and can cause significant demands in the structure that shares a similar fundamental period. And so with this, uh, the site's proximity to the Hayward Fault is about 3.4 miles. The Hayward is a subfault of the overall San Andreas Fault. And so representative time histories were chosen that contain these near source characteristics. Near source records often have a short duration in comparison to those that are recorded at long distances. 
This requires a balance to be struck between representing a wide range of outcomes. Given that a uh, wide range of attributes each ground motion suite was required to incorporate, the dispersion between spectral values was higher than typically seen for a similar site in San Francisco. The site hazard demands in Oakland represent a multiplier of 1.5 to 2 for a similar structure in San Francisco, and this is primarily due to the extreme near fault conditions that occur at Oakland, but also due to the site classification. Most sites in Oakland fall under site class D, whereas many of them in San Francisco fall under site class C. And a bit on the directionality at this location, because we're so close to the fault, the fault normal was almost the exact same profile as the maximum direction fault. And it's because of this that we ended up providing a conglomeration of ground motions that allowed us to not have a structure that was biased one way or another. And then here's a quick graph just showing some of the other faults that are within this area. Uh, the Hayward Rogers Creek obviously being the closest at 3.4 miles and the San Andreas down there in the middle at 14.9 miles. To understand the clarity and understanding of these near source effects on the 1640 Broadway, an additional study was conducted utilizing time history records from another site in San Francisco to provide a comparison of the performance. Time history values used in the trial study represent a conditional mean spectrum from a tower in a similar height, lateral system, conditioning periods, and site class. The product of this study shows that the San Francisco ground motions induced a peak drift, approximately 60% those of those uh, seen from the Oakland hazard requirement. And then additional considerations on the design for this project, this existed near or right next to uh, the existing Bay Area Rapid Transit Tunnels, or BART. And additionally, uh, the structure exists on uh, hundreds of feet of clay that will slowly consolidate over time. BART does provide some general guidelines for designing and constructing adjacent to their structures. However, project-specific review and approval is still required. The primary criteria to be followed is that any change to the existing condition shall be analyzed to justify that there are no temporary or permanent adverse impacts to the tunnel structure. This really controlled how our structural foundation system was determined. Uh, a zone of influence shown at the bottom of the tunnel and extending up at a 1.5 horizontal to one vertical slope was established and piles and uh, ground improvement, which was shaded on here, but is hard to see. Uh, <laughs> so we actually had ground improvement extending just underneath this BART zone of influence line. And this is about 80 feet from the property line to where that hits the top of the mat foundation. So we used a hybrid system in order to combat this. So we used double case piles extending about 45 feet past the BART zone of influence. Each of these have a sleeve around them that allows us to not have any skin friction on the primary pile until you actually get below the BART zone of influence. And because of this complex analysis or this complex condition using a hybrid system, we actually ended up using a geotechnical model to use a 3D model of the substructure and then analyze to figure out what happened when this building settled. And it's because of this that we were able to determine we don't just need to spec the capacity for those piles, but also a stiffness requirement so that our mat foundation analysis also matches the performance that we'd see out in the field. Through this, the geotechnical engineer was able to justify that no adverse impacts were to be imposed on the existing tunnel structure. Overturning moments determined from the nonlinear time history analysis shown in this slide. So this is one record. We took the envelope of every single record and then ended up marching all the way around at each delta theta and took the average of all the peak values that occurred within each record to determine the overturning record that would be applied to our foundation model. And we actually used this foundation model to determine springs that would be in our nonlinear time history analysis. So it was a twofold thing where we did the nonlinear model and got out initial moments and then went back and then reanalyzed it using springs to soften the period and actually get the overall performance. It should be noted that the map flexural capacity was determined using all code related fees uh, but using expected material properties. And so in closing, uh, we just wanted to make sure that the project 
provided a vehicle for establishing the required formwork for review the complex issues associated with the performance-based approach. This raised new issues associated with designing a structure with extreme near source seismic hazard considerations. And it's due to these extreme demand levels that the project had to break away from typical proportioning schemes used in other jurisdictions like San Francisco, California. The solution involved uh, implementation of high reinforcement ratios and a greater quantity of embedded steel coupling beams. And at this time, I'd like to open up any questions, if we have time. Okay. What should be on the foundation? You yep. did the DBE design and the, obviously the performance design. What was the difference in the moment of the foundation between the DBE and the... So, uh... You normalize them, basically. Yeah, so our, our initial design, we actually used a multiplier of two and a half on the DE design to get proportioning for the map set. And then the performance model, the perform model ended up producing results that were similar within about 10 to 15 percent. So I think around two and a half would give you a good number. Did you consider the vertical size B? No, no, we did not. Awesome. Thank you.